Uterine septum. What is a uterine septum and what can you do about it? How do you know if you have one? Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford and today I'm talking about a birth defect inside the uterus called a uterine septum. I'm a fertility doctor and this means I talk about fertility every single day with my patients and one of the top things I do is evaluate the uterus and see if there's any issues that might be preventing pregnancy or contributing to a pregnancy loss. This channel exists all to educate you about your body and your fertility and if you want to support this message so that more people can learn about their own body, please subscribe and follow along. Let's dive in and talk about what a uterine septum is. In order to understand a septum, you have to understand how the uterus is formed. Your uterus is actually formed in what we call the Mullerian ducts. These are two little buds that start out when you're a fetus. Everybody, when they're a baby, actually has these. And then XY on the Y chromosome has something called a Mullerian inhibiting substance that prevents these from growing. And that's why XY chromosome people do not have a uterus. But if you have these Mullerian ducts, what is then going to happen is that these ducts are going to elongate, fuse together. And these become the two different halves of what we think of of the reproductive system. This midline connecting portion will reabsorb and that's what gives almost that tubular canal-like structure. These ducts compose the top third of the vagina, the cervix, the uterus, and the fallopian tube. Ovaries are different embryologically, so is the lower two thirds of the vagina. So this is just that middle bulk portion surrounding the uterus. And you can have defects against the entire spectrum of this Mullerian duct development. And because the Mullerian ducts develop at the same time and really in close proximity to the kidneys, when you do have a birth defect of the uterus, you are at a higher risk to have a birth defect of the renal system, whether that's a ureter or a kidney issue. So anytime you get diagnosed with a Mullerian abnormality, we like to make sure that the kidney structure is intact as well, specifically when you talk about duplication or you're missing an entire half. So you can have birth defects on the entire side, meaning you can have complete failure of the Mullerian ducts. This is called Mullerian agenesis or Meyer-Rokitansky Kuster-Hauser. MRKH syndrome, complete absence of a uterus from birth. Then you can have one side form and the other not. That's called a unicornuate uterus. You may or may not have what we call a rudimentary horn, like the remnant of that little bud. You can have two totally separate development, like two cervical openings, two uterine tracts. That's called a uterine didelphus. And then you can have partial fusing, partial reabsorption, and this is on different spectrums. The two more common ones are considered a bicornuate uterus and a uterine septum, and these can sometimes be difficult to distinguish clinically. So if we think about the structural difference, in a septum, which is much more common, what you see is complete fusion of the uterine cavity, but there's failure of reabsorption of that midline avascular tissue or the uterine septum. So you get this remnant tissue that is protruding into the uterine cavity. In a septate uterus, the outside of the uterus looks perfectly normal. So if you had your appendix removed, nobody would be able to tell you have a uterine issue. The outside of the uterus looks structurally very fine. In a bicornuate uterus, you have failure of full fusion. So if we think about that, only the lower part of the cavity fuses together, the top part is separate. So this is what you might classically think of a heart-shaped uterus because it looks like a heart on the outside, and then it looks like a heart on the inside. The inside of the uterus, if I'm to evaluate these two, is actually going to look very similar. So in absence of knowing what the outside of the uterus looks like, so for example, an HSG test or a hysterosalpingogram, where we put dye in the inside of the uterus and let it move out the fallopian tubes while we take x-ray. That test cannot distinguish between a bicornuate and a septum. And that is because on the inside of both of them, they are going to look very similar, a midline indentation. However, if I have an ultrasound, a saline sonogram, a 3D sono, an MRI, or if I do laparoscopy, I will be able to tell that in a bicornuate, the top or the outer portion of the uterus follows that indentation. And in a septum, the outer part of the uterus is normally intact like we would think. Reproductive outcomes in these two situations are different as well. So in a bicornuate uterus, you have complete muscular growth around that indentation. So there's no avascular tissue per se. Yes, there are some different reproductive outcomes with a bicornuate, largely preterm birth and breech presentation because the structure of the uterus is different. But in a uterine septum, what we know and what we see is a much higher risk of miscarriage than with any 
other uterine abnormality or with a normal uterus. So overall, less than 4% of the population has a birth defect of the uterus and septums account for about 35 to 40% of all of those. And that's the highest category. We have numerous studies that have shown that when you have a uterine septum, you have a much higher chance of a pregnancy loss or a miscarriage than if you do not. 70 to 80% of pregnancies in a patient with a uterine septum are going to miscarry versus typically 15 to 20% of controls depending on your age. And this is a huge discrepancy. This is why if you have a current pregnancy loss, one of the top things we need to evaluate is do you have a Mullerian anomaly? Even though they're not common, they are much more common in the population that's having recurrent miscarriages. If you have a uterine septum, what we know is removing a uterine septum improves your live birth rates. So there is debate on if it improves your pregnancy rate or not, although some studies say yes, but what we have clear consistency on in the literature is that removing the septum improves the risk of miscarriage, meaning you have a lower chance of miscarriage, a higher chance of live birth after the septum is removed. When you remove a uterine septum, it's called a hysteroscopic septum resection or metroplasty. You're putting a camera in through the cervix and you can see the two different sides of the uterus with the avascular septum in the center. Essentially, you can see that septum coming towards you and it tends to be more white or pale in color because there's not blood supply. You can cut that septum and people have different styles. I use just cold scissors and cut it until the level of either where I see bleeding or trying to get close to where those fallopian tubes are. If I can imagine this indentation, I'm cutting it up so that I can normalize what we think about as that normal triangular shape of the uterine cavity. Overall risk of complication with this procedure is really low, less than 2%. And the most common complication is going to be uterine perforation or cutting a hole in the top of the cavity. Now, this is overall extremely rare and in trained hands, this is extremely unlikely, but this is why you wanna make sure that somebody who's doing your septum resection is trained to do so. Somebody who does a lot of hysteroscopic surgery, typically that is going to be a reproductive endocrinologist or a fertility doctor or a minimally invasive gynecologic surgeon. Some OBGYNs feel comfortable with septums and some do not. So it's a clear question that you should ask. Is this a procedure you do common? Do you feel comfortable with this? Now, after everybody is trained different. So I was trained to try to prevent scar tissue from forming because I have seen patients who have a septum removed and then scar tissue just forms in the place where the septum was. And then they have the same problem avascular tissue that a pregnancy can't implant on. That's why you have a higher risk of a miscarriage because that tissue that's hanging down doesn't have good blood supply. So when that placenta comes and tries to implant, it can't get that good vascular connection that it needs into that muscular portion of the uterus so it miscarries. And most of these miscarriages are gonna be in the first trimester when implantation is occurring. So if you have scar tissue, you have the same problem as a septum. If we go and we take out the septum, then we see improvement in that. And I don't want scar tissue to form. So I place a balloon, some type of plastic catheter, stent inside the uterus to keep the uterine walls apart. Remember the uterus is a potential space. And so we're keeping those walls apart. And then I'm doing a hormonal treatment with estrogen and antibiotics, trying to get that lining to heal. And I like to do repeat imaging to make sure everything is gone. And typically that's with a saline sonogram. You can have a septum and it cannot be diagnosed on regular ultrasound because remember, uterus is a potential space. So if I have an avascular piece of tissue inside here, you may not see it. Just if we can imagine, you don't know I have a pen in my hands. I have a pen in my hands. If I go and place water in my uterus and distend it, now you're going to see the pen. But when the uterus is a potential space, you cannot. This is why most imaging is going to require installation of some type of liquid into that uterine cavity so you can see what is there. That is the premise behind a saline sonogram or an HSG test. One thing to know is that most people with septum have no side effects. It has nothing to do with your period. You still have normal periods. You don't have any signs. You still use tampons just like normal. There's no higher risk of pain or having issues with your periods. Some people with a we do see higher rates of endometriosis in people who have Mullerian abnormalities in general. So you might have more painful periods, but most of the time, this is a completely asymptomatic presentation until you get a fertility evaluation or you're being evaluated for recurrent pregnancy loss. There is some debate in the field if you should have a septum removed, if you have secondary infertility, or if you've had no pregnancy losses. Talk to your doctor. My overarching belief 
and I'm extremely biased as somebody who went through fertility stuff and had many miscarriages myself, is that you shouldn't have to prove your uterus can't hold a baby in order to get a surgery when something has such a high risk, 70 to 80% of a miscarriage. If we find a septum, I wanna take care of it before you get pregnant and save you the heartbreak of a pregnancy. If your doctor says no, and your gut tells you this might be an issue, get a second opinion that is easy enough. Ultimately, that recovery process for the septum does take approximately an entire month. I like to do the surgery when you're on birth control pills so I can keep the lining of the uterus really thin so I can see where I'm going. Meaning, what is the timeline here for recovery? Have a period, start your birth control pills, have the surgery on the pills, have about a month of hormone treatments to recover, check a saline sonogram before you can get cleared. I tell patients plan on it being eight to 10 weeks to get this process done and healed appropriately. And then you can jump into trying again naturally or fertility treatments depending on your situation. 100% have seen patients get a septum removed and get pregnant naturally. And that is always such a happy time for us. The truth is, remember, if you are having pregnancy losses, you need to get an evaluation. There may not be any physical symptoms that something is wrong, and sometimes you do not know until you go and look. Hope that helped answer some questions about your uterus and what a uterine septum or a uterine birth defect is. Remember, you cannot always diagnose it on transvaginal ultrasound. Sometimes you can, but not always. So if you had one ultrasound and somebody said your uterus is normal, could they evaluate everything that they need to? That's a good question. As always, you can get more information on the As A Woman podcast or follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford, MD. Thanks, friends.